My name is Skip Rutherford. I'm Dean of the University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service. And welcome tonight in our series of 2008 Public Programs and Distinguished Lectures. Uh, we are very honored to have uh, a very distinguished speaker and author with us. I hope uh, if you haven't purchased his book, I hope you will and let him sign it for you at the conclusion uh, of tonight's program. To introduce him is a student of mine, uh, and I say that because I had the pleasure of teaching him when I was a visiting professor at the University of Central Arkansas, where he was an undergraduate, and then later uh, I've had the privilege of serving as his dean here at the Clinton School. Jose Guzarde is from Sao Paulo, Brazil, a graduate of UCA's Honor College. He studied uh, at the University of Vienna. Uh, this year, uh, as part of his group public service project, he's working with the Governor's After School and Summer Task Force, assessing uh, the needs and availability of after school and summer programs for children. He will then this summer, as part of his international public service work, work for Kissinger McClarty Associates which, as you know, is very heavily involved in issues regarding Latin America. So please welcome Jose Guzardi. Thank you. Well, in just eight days, Arkansas and several other states will be selecting their Republican and Democratic nominees for President of the United States. Issues like the economy, immigration, national security, and foreign affairs are at the center of the debates. And some claim that this will be one of the most important elections in American history. Likewise, these issues also challenged the Romans and marked the fall of the Roman Empire. Comparisons between America and the Roman Empire is not anything new. But in Are We Rome, Colonel Murphy goes past the usual rhetoric and draws lessons on how America might avoid Rome's demise. One of his suggestions that particularly caught my interest is, was a call for instituting a program of national, national service for all young people. Murph is the editor at large of Vanity Fair magazine, and previously served for two decades as the managing editor of the Atlantic Monthly. He's the author of The World According to Eve, Just Curious, and Rubbish and he's currently working on a book about the Inquisition. Please join in welcoming Colin Murphy. Thank you, thank you very much, Jose. And um, thank you, Skip. And thanks to everyone here at the, at the Clinton School. Uh, it's wonderful to be here in, in Little Rock. The last time I was here, this entire complex was actually a kind of bath of mud, and um, it, it cleans up very nicely. <laughs> I wish I could say that it was this president uh, who helped put me in mind of doing this book, but the, the coincidence of fate um, is that it was his successor, uh, that actually precipitated the writing of this book um, in, a, in a very particular sense. About four years ago, I was traveling to Ireland and our, uh, our jet landed at Shannon Airport. And as we were um, moving down the uh, tarmac towards the uh, arrival lounge, the pilot said, look out your window, you're going to see something that you probably will never again see in your life. And, uh, and I did, and he was right. It was both of the American President's Air Force Ones were there on the tarmac, parked nose to nose. The Bush had arrived for a European summit, um, which I guess takes two Air Force Ones. And, uh, <laughs> and already, the, the planes had arrived a couple of hours before we had, and already they were surrounded by concertina wire. US troops had been brought in 
from elsewhere in Europe. Surface-to-air missiles were there. Um, sharpshooters were on top, top of the duty-free store. Very, very little shoplifting that day. The uh, <laughs> Irish tanks were, such as they are, were out on the, the, uh, the, the little uh, roadways. Um, but in that picture, uh, for a moment there flashed in my mind something I had read years before, which was an, an account in a history book of a progress of a Roman emperor through the, through the provinces. In the later years of the empire, the Roman emperor, emperor spent very little time in Rome, actually. Um, most of his time was spent out of the city, putting out fires one way or another. And he brought the government with him, um, you know, the mint, the intellectuals, there's a difference, the um, trans <laughs> translators, um, the, the food tasters, uh, and you know, in many respects, although it took, uh, it required a lot more space uh, for the Roman emperor uh, to move around, um, but in fact, uh, he was traveling with a microcosm of the Roman government the same way the president is with Air Force One. And uh, so the correspondence of those two things uh, in that moment made me think that I should probably try to develop something that had been uh, percolating in my mind for a while, which was this comparison between uh, modern America and ancient Rome. Um, now, I've never been a distinguished lecturer before, and I'm not sure whether I do have some graphic images here. I'm not sure how well they will always comport with the distinguished part, um, but we'll see. The question I began asking myself in the few years uh, since that moment on the tarmac at Shannon Airport is the question I put on the cover of my book, Are We Rome? It's a question that Americans have been asking themselves for centuries for reasons that change over time. The Roman comparison is implicit in the way we talk. American troops abroad are legions, like the Roman legions of old. Nativist politicians refer to immigrants in hot and ugly language as barbarian hordes. Critics of our chief executive denounce an imperial presidency. People wringing their hands over a decadent American culture invoke the bread and circuses culture of Rome. The words decline and fall can't be used without our thinking of Rome. And those words, of course, lead us to thoughts about our own distant, we hope, future. So the comparison is everywhere. But the main reason it's on our minds today has to do with America's power in the world and how we use it and the mindset behind it. So let me begin with two quotations. One of them is from ancient Rome, sort of. Actually, it's from a Hollywood version of ancient Rome. <laughs> but it really does convey a true Roman state of mind. The quotation comes from, make sure I, there. The quotation comes from here. This is the famous bath scene from Spartacus. But the words being spoken might as well have come from Rome's version of the National Security Council. The man in the bath, Crassus, played by Laurence Olivier, drives, dries himself off and then brings the slave boy, Tony Curtis, out to a balcony and shows him the Roman legions marching by. There, boy, is Rome, says Crassus. There is the might, the majesty, the terror of Rome. There is the power that bestrides the world like a colossus. No man can withstand Rome. No nation can withstand her. How much less a boy. Now here's the modern version of this very same scene, cleaned up a little bit, with some of the same intimacy, but... <laughs> See, I told you I was worried about the distinguished part. <laughs> the quotation reported by the journalist Ron Susskind comes from an unidentified official high up in the Bush administration, very likely the man on the left. Here it is. We're an empire now, 
And when we act, we create our own reality. And while you're studying that reality, judiciously, as you will, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too. And that's how things will sort out. We're history's actors, and you, all of you, will be left to just study what we do. Now, you may endorse this sentiment and the ambitions behind it, or you may be skeptical, but the fact that some American leaders and opinion makers talk this way is one reason why people of all persuasions stop to wonder, are we wrong? Are we? Is there anything to this comparison? That's what I wanted to find out. The Roman Empire was the wealthiest, most powerful, most complex society the Western world had ever seen. It lasted in the West for about a thousand years until the fifth century AD. Maps of the fabled Pax Romana, which stretch from Scotland to the Sahara, from Spain to the Euphrates, have their own analog in maps of what some call the Pax Americana, with its nearly 800 military bases worldwide and its military operations in more than 100 countries. The symbol of Rome's global power was the imperial eagle, a symbol America explicitly took as its own two centuries ago, along with many other Roman symbols. Here it's being affixed to the door of Air Force One. And here's the ancient eagle that ours was copied from. Benjamin Franklin, as you might remember, had argued strenuously for a very different bird as our national symbol, which was, of course, the turkey. But he, he lost that argument for now. Uh, but the reminders of Rome and America are really all around us, aren't they? And they're not just about empire. The Emperor Augustus used to boast that he had found Rome a city of, of uh, brick and left it a city of marble. Washington, D.C., also a city of marble, was con conceived by its planners explicitly to be a new Rome. Its central monument honoring George Washington was copied from the obelisks of ancient Rome. The place where the legislature would meet was named for Rome's Capitoline Hill. Our Senate was named for Rome's Senate. America's founders looked back to Rome for a lot of reasons. One of them was that Rome was a republic that hadn't been able to remain a republic. They took lessons from Rome about the need for checks and balances and hoped they would prove durable. You have to wonder what they would think of the expansion of the chief executive's war powers since World War II under presidents of all parties, or about the practice of ducking legislation through the use of signing statements. I lived in Washington many years ago and often went up to the west front of the Capitol to look over the city. This was back in the days when you could walk on the grounds before the security system was in place. I sometimes wondered what this Rome, Rome-like place might look like in decay. It was from Rome's own Capitol Hill that Edward Gibbon, in the middle of the 18th century, looked out over the ruins of the Forum and resolved to write the great work that would be called The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. The first volume was published in 1776 as America broke away from England. Uh, but Gibbon, but Gibbon was no friend of the young republic. Once in Paris during the war, Ben Franklin ran into Edward Gibbon at a restaurant. He invited Gibbon to come to America, where Franklin impishly said he would help Gibbon collect material for his next book on the decline and fall of the British Empire. <laughs> when I began writing Are We Rome, I started out by compiling a ledger of differences and similarities. The differences are huge and important, and I'll come back to them. But I'll focus tonight mainly on similarities. And I'll begin by running quickly through some images that I've come across, because the juxtapositions are sometimes striking. One is the sense of manifest destiny. This is a Roman statue of the goddess of victory astride the cosmos. And this is a 19th century American painting of pioneers heading west. Exact same motif, pretty similar mindset. Protecting the frontier was another concern shared by Roman America. 
This is the U.S.-Mexico border near El Paso Juarez. This is Hadrian's Wall in the north of England, named for the emperor who built it. The contract for America's new high-tech virtual fence along the Mexican border has just been awarded to Boeing. So perhaps someday this will be known as Boeing's Wall. But we Americans, like the Romans, are also very ambivalent about our borders. Here's a stock image from modern America, captive illegal immigrants. And here's a stock image from ancient Rome, a bas-relief of a captive barbarian. Both of these images conceal an immense reality. Rome and America are the most successful assimilationist societies the world has ever known, turning outsiders into insiders through sheer force of culture. There are also plenty of statues of emperors welcoming Germanic tribes into the empire, not just kicking them out. And we do the same thing. I remember a, a Bush campaign commercial in 2004 that showed him surrounded by small, dark-haired Mexican children. And he had his arm around one of them, and with the other was, was uh, waving the Mexican flag. Other similarities. Americans are passionate about their public entertainments. And you have to admit that something of our own pastimes calls to mind the spectacles of yore. Roman consumer appetites were insatiable, as those of Americans are. If you couldn't buy a thing in Rome, the rhetorician Aristides once said, then the thing did not exist. This is the Mall of America, the greatest commercial emporium of our own time. And this is the Forum of Trajan, the greatest emporium of the ancient world, the Mall of Romanita, as I keep thinking of it. It had a food court. It probably had mall walkers. And of course, <laughs> there's the military aspect of Rome, which in some ways is always what comes first to mind when Rome and America are compared. Rome and America face the very same problem. They have militaries too small for all the jobs they keep being given, but too large and costly to be able to maintain comfortably. The classic challenge of what the historian Paul Kennedy calls imperial overstretch. But what militaries they were, what training, what organization. Like American troops, the Romans had dog tags, and so did their horses. America's military bases are standardized from Bagram to Baghdad, from Fort Leavenworth to Fort Bragg. Rome's rectangular, cookie-cutter military bases can be found by the thousands all over the former empire. This is a reconstruction of one at Vindolanda, up near Hadrian's Wall. American troops have Burger Kings in Baghdad. The Romans at Vindolanda had figs from Palestine. They had wine from Italy. And since we're on the subject of the military, I'd be remiss in overlooking a similarity in imperial iconography, in body language. At the peak of his reign, it is estimated that some 20,000 statues of Caesar Augustus had been erected in public throughout the empire all looking more or less exactly like this one. Something about that pose in military garb struck me as awfully familiar, and I finally remembered where I'd seen the modern version. <laughs> now, to give him his due, he does that a lot better than Michael Dukakis would have. <laughs> I've rushed quickly through a number of images, some of them touching on topics more important than others, all of them having to do with similarities. We can never forget the differences. America is a democracy, which Rome never was. America rejected slavery, which Rome never did. <coughs> Americans are a middle class people, a class that Rome barely had. Rome had attitudes about the role of women that Americans wouldn't tolerate for a second. But for all this, there are some comparisons between Rome and America that we really should pay attention to, because they offer lessons that I think are worth heeding. And I will mention just three. One has to do with who we're asking to do our fighting for us. As noted, Rome and America were in the same military bind. They both had armies too big to afford and too small to do all the jobs that they were being asked to do. 
the Romans eventually hired outsiders to supplement their legions. People like this man, Conan. <laughs> it wouldn't have been funny then. Conan the Barbarian. They hired the Goths and the Huns and other warriors from outside the empire to supplement their own armed forces. This turned out to be a very unhappy long-term solution. The hired guns, not guns, the hired, hired guns didn't always stay hired. America is hiring outsiders too, people like this man, Conan the Contractor. <laughs> We are hiring people like him to close the military man manpower gap between what we have and what we need, just as Rome did. This fellow happens to work for a company called Blackwater, which has been in the news quite a lot in recent months, because it seems to be functioning virtually as a sovereign state, accountable to no one. Here in Iraq, it has its own air force. We see its bear paw flag, flying alongside those of two well-known actual countries, as if it too was a country. In Rome, eventually, the outsiders virtually became the military. When Rome was sacked in 410 AD, it was by warrior contractors who had once been in Rome's employ. It's as if Washington were one day to be sacked by Halliburton. A second key parallel is closely related but vastly larger. It can be lumped under the term privatization. In America, we're all familiar with the way people and interests with private agendas try to carve off pieces of the government for their own purpose and profit. Sometimes, in the halls of Congress, you can almost see this happening right in front of your eyes. That same process of milking the government for everything it's worth is not what this Roman statue is really about, of course, but somehow, <laughs> The statue always brings it to mind. Privatization is about something bigger than profit and bigger than corruption. It's about what happens when public functions fall more and more into private hands and government slowly loses the power to step on the pedal or turn the wheel. Rome had real trouble maintaining a distinction between public and private responsibilities and the power of the center to act in a crisis, to exert its will, grew less and less. America, in recent years, has embarked on a privatization binge like no other in its history, putting into private hands all kinds of activities once thought to be public, collecting our taxes, patrolling our streets, maintaining our highways, defending our borders. Think of Boeing's wall. There's a name for where we're heading. It's called feudalism. The third parallel I'll mention is that sense of manifest destiny. Rome and America share a sense of national destiny as momentous, permanent, divinely ordained. Imperium sine fine, the Romans said, empire without end. On our own dollar bill, we have a Latin phrase from Virgil, novus ordo seclorum, which gets the same idea across, a new order of the ages, something permanent. You know, finally, we've got the picture. Romans and Americans share a sense of themselves as uniquely powerful in the center of everything. What this can lead to is a kind of blindness toward the outside world, as if how people think and behave uh, beyond our borders is hardly worth trying to understand. Rome had a monument in the forum called the Umbilicus, making the point that here, on this spot, was the actual belly button of the world. In Washington, there's a stock and self-satisfied phrase you often hear about the president as the most powerful man in the most powerful city in the world. I once heard the maitre d' At, a wash, at, at the Washington Palm restaurant, referred to as the most important man in the most important restaurant in the most important city in the world. <laughs> it's an insidious frame of mind. I remember at one gathering being asked, did the Romans write cautionary books called, you know, Are We Greece? Are We Babylon? 
as if they had a sense that time might run out on their own culture too? They thought about that question to be sure, but they decided that the answer was no, that history had really come to an end, and that Rome was the final stop, and Roman will could achieve anything. We're not at that stage yet, but I think you can see a genetic disposition. In my book, I worry about similarities like these and several others. I worry about the projection of outward power at the expense of inward decay. I try to describe what the fall of Rome really was. It wasn't always the barbarians at the gates of myth and movie, and argue that you can see signs of this kind of transformation in our own country right now. And I make some specific suggestions, not about flash freezing American power, which is impossible, uh, as a theologian, Wynald Niebuhr, pointed out half a century ago, but simply about making life better for the people who live under it. Let me conclude, though, with some thoughts not simply about Rome and America, but more about the subject that really underlies it, a topic that I find myself reflecting on more and more. It's a question about the uses of history and about whether history has much practical use at all. Certainly, we can agree that history has some sort of emotional use. We look at the stunning engravings of a Piranesi and are brought face to face with the ravages of time and the futility of pride. We look at fanciful renderings of our own imagined capital uh, sometime down the road and see the wag of a finger in an invitation to humility. But beyond this, does history teach us anything else? Does it have a prescriptive function? It's a very contentious question. Historians who teach in colleges and universities are often skeptical of trying to draw explicit lessons from history. No historical episode is exactly like any other, they point out, so no parallel can ever be exact. Too often, they say, people focus on a handful of similarities and ignore all the differences. Worst of all, history gets hijacked for ideological reasons, as when American officials cite the appeasement of, uh, at Munich to get our armies marching, or the quagmire of Vietnam to keep our armies home. Even when people try to learn sensibly from the past, they may be deriving conclusions that have no relevant ex you know, application. That's what the phrase, fighting the last war, is all about. The British historian A.J.P. Taylor used to say, the only lesson of history is that there are no lessons of history. The scholars are right to be wary. In many ways, the history of history is a saga of the misuse of history. At the same time, as one eminent historian points out, to rule out any hope of lessons risks making history especially the history of a place like Rome, into little more than a theme park. Personally, I'm not ready to throw in the towel on the lessons question. And if you take a look at Are We Rome, you'll see it isn't a theme park. I do have some ideas about things that we ought to do. But specific lessons aside, I believe that we in the present should be pressing historical methods into service in ways that make us think harder about our society and its behavior. Let me take you back to a specific moment in time, a hot summer day, August 24th, 79 AD. This was when Mount Vesuvius erupted and buried the city of Pompeii under a mountain of ash and pumice. The city would lie undiscovered for 1,700 years. Even today, it is only partially excavated, a city for <clears throat> forever preserved in its moment of death. Here and there, archaeologists have injected plaster into cavities in the soil, yielding haunting sculptures of those who didn't make it, a boy and his dog, a mother and her child, a husband sheltering his wife. And now, <clears throat> the task for the historian is this. They have been given a vast and static snapshot of a culture snuffed out in a day. 
What can we learn from this snapshot? How can we know the meaning of what we see? From what is left, what can we say about the rich and the poor, or about sex, or about attitudes towards leisure time, or about the strength or weakness of family bonds? Am I alone in calling to mind another hot summer day much more recently, when the sudden end came not from a familiar mountain, but from a familiar sky and sea? Hurricane Katrina brought a modern city to a standstill and killed off many neighborhoods, perhaps forever. Homeowners will be excavating the city for generations. Some rooms already have that faded, frescoed look of ancient Pompeii. And in this instance, of course, there's no need for archaeologists or injected plaster to see the devastating human consequences. So here we have another city stopped in its tracks. In a way, we are very far from Rome, but in a way, we are also very close. The book I called Are We Rome might also have been called Who Are We? As with Pompeii, as with Rome as a whole, in every snapshot of New Orleans, there lies a question mark. And every question mark is a question mark for a historian. What led up to this picture? Why do we see what we see? Who were these people? What kind of a society can we deduce from the images? How would you define this society's values, its capabilities, its strengths, its blind spots? Was it just? Was it self-critical? Which way was it heading? How would you tell its story? If we could freeze frame the world around us today and then suddenly look at it through the future's lens, what would be our verdict on ourselves? The most important lesson of ancient Rome for modern America is that we must start asking ourselves that question. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. We have two mics in the audience, so please wait till I get there so everyone can hear you. Wonderful talk. Uh, Thank I you. Enjoyed it. Well, when you look at the, all the mega powers, you don't have to go back to Rome. Look at Spain, Portugal, England. They've all gone through the same stages. They overextended their military, they, and they could not afford it. Multiple wars, and that's what led to the decline. I think it's a pretty simple story. You don't have to go back to Rome. <clears throat> that's true. Um, fortunately, I happen to love going to Rome, so. <laughs> The, 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 you, were you all able to, to hear the question? Briefly, it has to do with the fact that you don't need to use Rome. You could have, you could have picked Spain. You could have picked the Netherlands, Portugal, Britain. And, um, and in some sense, that's, I mean, in a very real sense, that's, that's true. There's a new book out by a professor at Yale Law School named Amy Chua, which does exactly this. It goes through all of the the empires and makes various comparisons. And it's a very provocative and, and also entertaining um, book. But one reason to pick Rome is because Americans have been focused on Rome from the beginning in a way that we have not been focused on other empires. The fact that the founding fathers had Rome on their minds, they were all trained classically. The stories of Horatio at the bridge or uh, the, the assassination of Caesar, uh, the end of the Republic and the, the birth of a tyranny, these were second nature to Roman, um, to, to the founding fathers. It, in their minds, uh, it was as close, those stories were as close to them as World War II is to us. Um, and probably closer than World War II is to my children. Um, so that's one of the reasons I picked it, because of this long continuity in our, in our history. 
Yep. Hi, um, we've talked about the military a little bit. Um, did your research uncover anything with respect to the economy of Rome? Um, when we typically think of the Romans as great engineers, aqueducts, roads, um, as they move towards decline, did that change? Um, for example, with the United States, the, the decline of manufacture, the rise of the national debt? Um, that's, that's a fascinating question. Uh, scholars have been trying to get a handle on the Roman economy for, um, for, for a long time. It's very hard because we don't have, as the economists would, economists would say, we don't have data sets. There's almost, uh, there's almost no information about what the Roman economy uh, was. But let me mention a couple of, um, of things that might be of, of interest. Um, one is, in my book, I, I do not concentrate as heavily on economic matters as I do on many other matters, partly because of the difficulty of, of having solid information, but also partly because the Romans simply did not have the kind of tools that we, for better or worse, do have. They didn't have deficit spending, for instance. Um, they just didn't know how to do it. Um, they did know how to uh, debase the currency. They did that very well. Um, uh, so the, uh, their, their economy just didn't work the way ours does. And it was also very much an Iron Age economy. It was, it, it was agrarian. Um, it was based on, on slaves. Um, land was the most important um, you know, economic uh, uh, commodity. So um, I decided I would go a little bit light on, on the economy. The technology uh, issue I find to be fascinating. Um, we all know that, as you stated, the Romans were, were terrific at technology, those roads, those aqueducts, and so on. You know, the, the, Rome, the sewer, the main sewer in, in the city of Rome is still is the, is the one that was uh, built by the Romans. And um, so undeniably, they had that capacity. However, they were not all that great in thinking up new technology. They were not, they were not um, uh, uh, creators of new te technology. In some ways, the barbarians were better at it. And um, there's, there's been a long debate as to what accounts for this. Uh, one, one answer that some people give, uh, and can't be the only answer, is slavery. If you have uh, an infinite supply of, of labor-saving devices known as people, um, what is the uh, incentive to start making labor-saving devices um, known as, uh, you know, washing machines or water power and so on? Whereas uh, the barbarians, um, although many of them had slaves, not to the extent that the Romans did. And so you, you do see technology being uh, invented and deployed in, um, in barbarian regions to a degree sometimes that the Romans uh, don't. The Romans had water power. They, you know, they knew the principle of being able to use water to turn wheels and um, you know, grind flour and, and so on. Uh, but they didn't, they didn't do it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing uh, uh, oversight. Teacher, did you have one? Do you see any prospects for domestic renewal? It looks like Rome had more of a succession leadership problem. Uh, but the United States has ways of, our political system takes care of that. But we also have society, especially civil society. Do you see prospects for domestic renewal to break the pattern? This is where I should say I have a program called Putting People First, right? Um, <laughs> The last chapter of my, of my book really does address uh, the issue of what can we do. And I half-jokingly have something that I call the Titus Livius 100-year workout plan. Um, Titus Livius is the Latin name for Livy, the, the, the historian. And, um, and he is known for a remark that empires are strong as long as their subjects rejoice in them. So you can ask. Do we rejoice in whatever it is we're living in, or, or is our attitude somewhat less than a full-throated rejoicing? And uh, full-throated rejoicing. And um, um, 
As you would see, when, uh, if you read the last chapter of my book, I'm, I'm unaccountably an optimist. I actually do think that uh, there are enormous reserves in American society for renewal. Uh, I was talking with some, um, some people from the school just a few minutes ago about my, uh, um, my belief that some sort of national service, for instance, is probably in the offing in the next decade, that for very different reasons, you, you, both the left and the right are converging on the idea that this could be something that America needs. Um, and I also see in America a particular quality that is nearly absent from Rome, and that has to do with this, um, this impulse toward self-improvement and toward self-criticism. Uh, the Romans didn't do very much of this. They were extremely self-satisfied. I quoted uh, a few minutes ago the, the Roman rhetor rhetorician Aristides talking about how if you can't buy something in Rome, it doesn't exist. Well, that's part of a speech that goes on for about two hours about uh, just what a great place Rome is, and it, you know, it doesn't get any better than this, and so on. Uh, the, the Roman elite were extremely satisfied with what they had, uh, and for good reason. It was a great society for about 10,000 people out of, out of 60 million. Um, America doesn't have that same sense of complacency. I mean, sure, there are people who are complacent, and sometimes all of us are somewhat complacent, but it isn't our default attitude, I don't think. Um, you see it in phenomena that are easy to make fun of. You go to a bookstore, and um, you, know, you see a little a few bookshelves devoted towards history, and then you see the rest of the store is self-help. Well, um, OK. But the impulse behind self-help is largely a good impulse. It's, it's one that um, it's based on self-scrutiny. It's based on the idea that things aren't static, that they can be improved. And uh, so I point in my book to that quality as it, it really it stands out in my mind as the fundamental mental difference between our two places. On this side. About two years ago, I saw a documentary on Rome, and it said that the population was approximately one million. And the question that I was going to ask you uh, before you gave me part of the answer was that the Roman Empire had a population of 60 million. It appears to me that somewhere along the line, I wonder if that 60 million were considered Roman citizens. Um, n not all of them, but, but let me get to what I think is probably the, uh, the heart of your question. When I say not all of them, that's because always a large portion of those 60 million would have been slaves and would have just been not, you know, in the Roman mind, not capable of, of being citizens. Uh, it took a long time for the Romans to develop the idea that citizenship was something that ought to be provided to more than just the core Roman population. Initially, it was just the city of Rome. The, the rest of the Italian peninsula, it took hundreds of years before the Romans decided to say, all right, all right, you can be citizens too. I mean, it took wars before this happened. Um, uh, but then eventually, uh, through the Edict of Caracalla, the Roman emperor extended Roman citizenship to any free citizen. We're looking at, you know, of course, very long time horizons uh, here. Um, um, but, it, but eventually, it got to the point where it, it, any free citizen was effectively uh, a Roman, Roman citizen. Um, behind this um, you know, lies the whole issue of assimilation. Was Rome good about making people into Romans? And did they want that to happen? Or did they resist the notion? Or were they frightened of it? And uh, they didn't actually think very much about it. There was nothing like a Department of Romanization. And they didn't actually have many overt tools, like, like public education or advertising, that would turn people into Romans. But they did a really, really good job of it. The Roman society was so attractive, so stable, orderly, safe, that the, the people wanted to buy, buy into it. Um, I talk about this, in a, I devote an entire chapter to that issue of, of assimilation, Romanness, 
uh, and by analogy, Americanness, uh, how good a job we do. And this is another area where uh, I'm more rather than less optimistic. I, I, see, the, I see the power of, of America to make people into Americans, even as the idea of America, of course, changes as time goes on. But I see it as being uh, immense and bigger than we tend to give it credit for. Hey. I've never known when the United States wasn't the big, you know, leader of the free world. And I was quite looking forward to living long enough to witness our decline. I think it would be quite nice. You can die now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, have you given any thought to that? What would it be like after whatever is this decline and, and what happened to Rome? after it fell, and I just think it would be such a relief. Have, have you noticed what a nice place to visit Italy is? <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're, all, we're all victims of our time horizons. You, you, you say that you don't remember a time when America wasn't the top dog, and neither do I. Uh, uh, but my parents did, my father did. Um, my father was born in 1919 and went off to war at the age of 20. In those first 20 years of his life, America wasn't the top dog. Uh, most, for, for most of our history, we were not the top dog. And you can argue that in the post-war period from the end of World War II to sometime around now, is that, is that our fate for our entire existence or is that an exception? You know, like the charts of oil usage. Um, you know, it'll end someday, so is, is, is that, is, is sole superpower status a blip, or is it destiny? Um, I'm, I'm sure that it's a blip, and that we will move on to something else, and you are seeing this occur in, in front of our eyes. Uh, you're also seeing America turn into a, a different kind of place domestically and, uh, and, and politically. You see, um, you know, we have a governor in California, for instance, who decides that uh, he doesn't necessarily like the environmental, uh, environmental regulations that the central government promulgates. Um, he doesn't necessarily like the strictures on scientific research that the federal government um, uh, wants. And so sets out to say, well, in, in my part of the country, we're going to do things differently. And you have a mayor in New York City saying the same thing. It's, is it hard to imagine that over time, and remember, these are century-long, centuries-long phenomena that over time, more and more places will do that. And America will become, you know, just perhaps a little bit less put together than the country that we've, we've known. It doesn't seem hard to me. And in much of the so-called decline of Rome really amounted to processes like that over long, long periods of time. Um, so I don't, I don't, uh, find it to be something particularly to fear. What I do say in my book is, uh, whatever this process is, it will be a lot easier on everybody if we pay attention more to how to make life better for people in general within whatever our political entity is, and less on trying to, to flash freeze our power at some zenith that uh, we think we like. We have time for one more question in the back. Uh, Hold on one second. A new poll just came out the news that said three out of four Americans are now knowing that America is going the wrong direction. And so my question is, I, don't know if you want, I hate to put you on the spot, but they, have you done a study on the time frame of of where America is on the time frame of the rise and fall of Rome and the rise and the fall of America. Do we have three years left, five years, or do you have any this? Do you have, I'm asking you, you know, we know we're in the last days. I'm a coming pastor and an evangelist and I travel over the world and a missionary. And I'm just kind of, um, you, probably, you probably have those years and numbers, but just not free to tell them. But I'd just like to know if you have any, if you could give us any kind of a, a uh, guesstimation of your time frame of what's left on the calendar. Pack your bags. No. I... <laughs> uh, that's, you know, that, that is the kind of question that, of course, when I began this book, I, 
I had on my, on my mind, you know, you know, two charts and figuring, oh, where are we? Oh, yes, we're Diocletian, and, uh, um, which has some, something to recommend it. But the fact is, is that in certain important ways, in many important ways, Rome and America just are, are different. And the time horizons, you can't just match them up with one another. Rome existed for a thousand years. We're scarcely you know, 200 years old as a, as a nation. Um, and history doesn't work according to those you know, deterministic um, sorts of ways. So you know, I, I fear that there, you know, there isn't really an answer to your question, except this one. Um, did Rome fall? Maybe that's the happy thought. You, you know, in, in, in certain ways, obviously, Rome did fall. Uh, it, it is no longer the political entity that it once was. Its borders are different, and so on. Uh, but in some ways, it hasn't fallen. I've, you know, the, the text I was reading today was using these little symbols that actually the Romans used. Um, that's a pretty substantial uh, bit of survival. Uh, the Catholic Church and much, much of Christianity actually uh, is carrying Roman DNA forward and has been um, you know, since an antiquity in all sorts of ways. It, it, some of them are easy to see, like the structure of dioceses and, and so on, and some of them are harder to see, you know, attitudes towards, well, attitudes towards women. Um, so, you know, well, figuring out when things start in history, when things end in history, it's not, um, you know, I wish it was more like West Wing sometimes, but, <laughs> but it's not. But in many important ways, Rome still lives, and whatever happens to us, uh, America, well, I'm sure, will be living on for a long time, if only in the expression dot com. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much.